actually spent a lot of time on this program in recent weeks discussing yeah. petrol. I'm going to go to this gentleman down the front who had a point about Parliament. I'm just wondering when we're going to get Cardboard Kevin back. So. Oh, <laughs> well, it, it was symbolic of um, a message we were trying to send, that this man is not what he's seen. That Parliament is a serious place. No. <laughs> is that the message? <laughs> we... The, the issue of whether Parliament should sit on Fridays would not have um, raised any attention at all. We had an opportunity to show that the Prime Minister is not the man that he appears to be and what you see on TV is not what you get in Parliament. And that's what happened. I don't happened, think we so. should try to abolish wit and vigour in Parliament, though. I mean, having worked in the press gallery for a couple of years, you've got to have some pity on the poor journalists who have to sit there <laughs> hour after hour listening to these un terribly tedious speeches and occasionally, just miraculously, you'll get a Paul Keating saying, well, the question is, can a souffle rise twice <laughs> when he's talking about Andrew Peacock's leadership? Now, do you really want to ban that? And, of course, if politicians are talking about... I don't think about... about banning Parliament. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I think banning you got off wit. the wrong foot there. No, banning wit. But, and, and, of course, if they're discussing petrol... If they're discussing their equally ridiculous policies on petrol prices, <laughs> they're not doing any harm, are they? The cardboard yeah. camp was a winner. Okay. Right. That was a winner because uh, the, the, the PM rolled over on that issue a couple of days later. That's I mean, you right. had a big win on that. We did. All right, OK. Let's go to an SMS question. It comes from Mark in Paddington. That's in Paddington in New South Wales, I imagine. Why does Labor, why does Labor seat the youngest and prettiest woman <laughs> in the camera view behind Kevin Rudd? You can see I haven't read that before. Now, there's a serious question. Let's, let's go to Tony Burke. I'm just trying to work out, there, shouldn't you? I'm trying to work out how many members of the caucus that now offends. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is, is there a seating plan to surround Kevin Rudd by attractive people? <laughs> There's, ever, since, ever since we moved to that parliament and question time started to be televised each, each day, I think it's fair to say that whoever is in the marginal seats has always occupied those four seats behind the leader on each side. Uh, well, to, give and them, to give them more airtime, is that the...? Essentially, if, well, put it this way, you look at the margins, you look at who's behind, that's how it's always been, both sides have always done it. Uh, and it basically means your reward for being in a safe seat is you're never going to get on that camera. But that's not actually true because um, behind Brenda Nelson sits Sophie Mirabella and she's in the seat of Indi and you wouldn't call that a marginal seat. No, but you so and, you and Joe is... are the big two behind Brenda. You're always sitting there going like this. <laughs> <laughs> Even when he's turning red and his veins are popping. I'm doing that. Have you seen on their side? No, I'm just um, enraptured by what our leader's saying. Oh. So I'm... <laughs> you got that's out right. of that pretty easily, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of face Facebook uh, thing going on here. If your face is on question time, you get more votes. Is that the theory? <laughs> <laughs> Both sides have done it for a long time. For a long time. Okay. I never saw Dick Adams behind. Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, Dick's view is that if he's up the front, no one can see who's behind him. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to go on to a completely different subject. Let's hear from uh, Jeff Ward in our audience. Where's Jeff? Uh, not, yeah. Over here. Uh, it's Dennis Ward, is it? Yeah, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Uh, it's not a completely different subject. I'm on about uh, petrol and tax again. Uh, <laughs> with uh, food price inflation and uh, the global food crisis, uh, do you think that uh, governments should be supporting uh, an, an ethanol industry, mm. making grain into ethanol through mandates and excise rebates and grants? OK, this is a question that's been around uh, all week because of the UN Food Conference that's going on, and that's been sparked by food riots in some 30-odd countries. Um, what do you think? I mean, should we be using arable land that's, that could be used for food for making biofuels? That's, that's the essence of it. Can I just say, first of all, the, I don't think many people in Australia realise at the moment the extent of the humanita humanitarian crisis that the world's actually facing. Uh, we've had for many times in the history of our planet famine in different spots. Uh, this is the first time uh, really that we're looking at food shortage as a global issue. Uh, now, a lot of people have argued that it's all because of the biofuels industry. Uh, that's actually wrong. The, the biofuels issue is part of it. And certainly if you can use biofuels from second generation, from some of the waste product rather than the staple food product, you can get away from some of that. Uh, but it's also the case that we're dealing with climate change, we're dealing with a growing middle class in parts of the world, which is causing a change in dietary preferences, There's a, and we're looking at a high world oil price. There's a whole lot of pressures that have come together. Yes, if staple food's being used, the, the wheat itself or something, or the corn, that of itself 
is something that you don't want to be seeing. But the second generation issues with ethanol and biofuels don't necessarily create those problems. So you're happy with grants, mandates, etc., to biofuels so that can be pumped into fuels with the theory that you're going to make it cheaper, but in fact millions of acres that would otherwise be used for food are not used for food. Are you well, happy with that well, no, Tony, in this country? If you're talking about second generation, then that's not what happens. Uh, you're talking about what, would, what is otherwise largely waste product, um, be, it from, be it from sugar, be it cell, cellulose, be it whatever product you've got left over at the end, going into playing a role in helping build a broader renewable energy base and doing something about a broader Tony, base for energy. No, no, let's, actually, let's hear from Dennis Ward. He asked the question. Yeah, I agree that a second and third generation biofuels industry is where we need to head. But mm. So why is, why is, for example, an E10 mandate in New South Wales uh, coming into play, which will end up with uh, you know taking grain out of the uh, the New South Wales feed grain. Uh, well, the the argument that's put from the plants uh, that are producing ethanol at the moment is uh, pretty much now what they are doing is second second generation. Uh, we're investing more into that to to see how much further we can go with that, and there certainly seems to be a, a good deal of scientific hope for what what might be able to develop uh, in the sugar industry. Uh, but the the E10 that you're getting at the moment. Uh, you know, by and large, you're not actually talking about staple food being used there. OK, we've got another question right up the very back there. Gentleman with his hand up. Um, I think second generation fuels for biofuels are un unproven, like clean coal. I think it's a bit of a myth at the moment. And I think it's a little bit obscene that we're using land that pe could be used for growing food for fuel for our cars. People are starving because of this. And I, I just, I can't see why the government would support a policy like that. that? It's not really true that people are starving because of this. Uh, there, this is a very tricky <coughs> and complex situation at the moment. I'm just back from Indonesia. Indonesia has a price of rice self, a policy of rice self-sufficiency and that protects rice farmers and it keeps the price of rice up. So they're not allowed to import rice. So you think, isn't, doesn't this make a lot of sense that they're going to be self-sufficient in rice? The people who suffer from that are the poor people who can't afford, who could buy much cheaper rice if it were allowed to be imported. We've got so many distortions and corruptions in the global food market. I would think biofuels are a tiny, tiny part of the distortions. If rich countries wanted to help, they could just rip out all their subsidies and protections, let poor countries earn some money from their agricultural produce and uh, then redistribute some of that money to the really poor people who, who need a bit of help in having enough money to buy enough food. But we're not short of food in an absolute sense. OK, quickly. I don't, we're, we're gonna, don't, we're, I don't think we should underestimate the challenge that's being posed by having agricultural land diverted to um, biofuels and the observed situation that has arisen where tropical rainforests, which are carbon sinks, have been cleared for biofuels. I mean, th that's ridiculous. And so I think that this is an enormous challenge. The, um, the focus on climate change and world food shortages. And if the planet is growing at something like six million people a month, I mean, this is going to be a massive issue globally. And the British chief scientist raised it um, in, a, in a paper recently to say that maybe, just maybe, we've got to um, perhaps go slower on our approach to climate change and greenhouse gas emissions while we feed the world's population. Now, this does reverse a lot of the, um, okay, so, the arguments so, we've been so hearing about. Are, are, you, are you against mandates and subsidies in Australia for biofuels to be mixed with petrol? Well, I think it's very interesting that the United Kingdom is rethinking its mandated um, ethanol biofuel. What are you, what are you thinking? Well, I'd, I'd like to see what they're doing in the United Kingdom. If they say that this, is, this has gone too far, that they want to rethink their mandate, well, then there's a lesson for us. We've really got to take this very... They've called it the elephant in the room we're, in we're the climate change pretty, debate. We're actually pretty modest in Australia. The biggest issue is the Americans. George Bush has gone hurtling down uh, converting arable land for biofuels, and that is what has been the biggest single country factor in this question. And I think, given the global crisis, as you call it, the Americans should be backtracking, backtracking at a rapid rate. All right, I'm going to change subject again. Our next question is from AJ Thomas. Yes, my question is to the opposition. Why are you backing the withdrawal of Australian troops in Iraq now when you should have done it when you were in power? Well, it was always going to be a case of seeing how um, Iraq was able to stand on its own two feet post um, the removal of Saddam Hussein. And we believe that over time, as the Iraqi government became a democratically elected government and that we were able, through the um, 